Ahoy! And in this video, we're going to be talking about the NASCARs of sports car racing, the Grand Am Daytona prototypes. But before we get into it, let's hear a word from our sponsors. Oh, wait. We haven't reached that point yet. Anyways, on with the video. Big, bulky, outdated, tube framed, ugly. Just a few words used to describe the premier class of the Grand Am Rolex sports car series. This class served from 2003 to the series end in 2013, and it also served the Tudor United Sports Car Championship from 2014 through to 2016. Even though this class was far behind its counterparts in the American Le Mans Series competition, it managed to outlive them. But why? And how? Well, let's dive into the history of these bricks with wings and wheels. Without getting too complicated too quickly, IndyCar and Kart were not the only series to split in the late 90s. The sports car world also saw a split between the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series and the American Le Mans Series. Even though that's a video in of itself, here's the short of it. Grand Am wanted cost control in a distinct racing product, while the American Le Mans Series wanted to bring Le Mans style racing to America as well as its ever-changing rulebook. The result was two different racing series competing against one another. In the beginning, the Rolex Sports Car Series used Le Mans style prototypes with the SRP1 and SRP2 classes. With speeds and costs rising on these modified Le Mans cars, Grand Am would step in and announce a new formula, a distinct formula, a class of cars that were cheap, long-lasting, with limited technology. Not too unlike the United States Postal Service vehicles that deliver your mail. You know, those ugly little boxes with no radio or heat or a tiny little fan just to keep them cool in the summertime. Yeah, basically the same principle. This new cart would have little to no carbon fiber, no development of the car whatsoever, no factory teams, and the engines would have to be production-based units from a manufacturer. Oh, and did I mention they'd be inherently slower than the SRP cars that they replaced? Yeah, I'm already starting to not like these cars. In early 2002, the NASCAR-owned Grand Am officially introduced the Daytona prototype category. They set its debut for the 2003 Rolex 24 at Daytona, the marquee race and season opener. As 2002 went on, a list of licensed chassis manufacturers came out. They included Riley, Crawford, Doran, Fabcar, Chase CCE, Piccio, and Multimatic. Along with the chassis manufacturers, the engine suppliers included Ford, Porsche, Chevrolet, BMW, and Toyota. Early on, the class seemed to be on shaky ground as teams were hesitant to jump to the new top category of the series at first. The biggest name to make the jump was Brumos Racing, entering two Porsche Fab cars for the 2003 season. Of note, the rest of the entries were obscure at best. So with that, let's jump to 2003, the debut. In this edition of the Rolex 24 at Daytona, the new Daytona prototypes would go up against the class it was replacing, the SRP2s, as well as the stalwart GT class, and finally, the GTS class, also in its swan song year. It didn't take long for the doubts and fears of these new concoctions to be realized. In qualifying, a GT class Corvette secured pole position and another GT class Mustang secured second. In third place was the first of the Daytona prototypes, a Multimatic Ford. Only six total Daytona prototypes even showed up, with over half of them qualifying on the lower half of the overall grid. Because of the lack of speed shown, the Grand Am officials placed the new class at the head of the field for the start of the race. However, at the end of the race, the inevitable result was realized. Kevin Buckler's TRG Porsche from the GT class took top honors. The top Daytona prototype, a Multimatic Ford, came home fourth overall, some 16 laps in arrears of the overall winners. Second in the Daytona prototype class was one of the Brumos Porsche Fab Cars, a further 18 laps back from the Daytona prototype class winner, and 34 laps adrift from the overall winning TRG Porsche. Third in class was a GNW Piccio, 228 laps behind the class winning Multimatic. The other three entries did not even finish. The debut race was a trial by fire, and it failed. The unreliability of the car showed to be its Achilles heel, and it showed greatly that day. It would continue to show in the lifetime of this card, being the deciding factor in many of the races it would compete in in the future. The first overall win would come at the next race at Homestead Miami Speedway, 
where Hurley Haywood and J.C. France would secure a win for the famous 59 Brumos Porsche Fab Car. The rest of the 2003 season would be dominated by the number 77 Bell Motorsports Multimatic Ford as well as Brumos' Porsche Fab Cars. The 2004 season was a make-or-break year for the Daytona prototypes. After a, well to say the least, tumultuous 2003 season, the big question would be whether this class would survive or would it capsize. The entry for Daytona showed that the class might actually survive and maybe even thrive. With 17 entries for the class, it was a massive improvement. But it wasn't just the numbers of the field that showed promise, but the entrants themselves. With teams like Wayne Taylor Racing, Chip Ganassi Racing, Howard Boss Motorsports, the new Meyer Shank Racing, and returning entries from Bell Motorsports and Brumos Racing, the promise for a great season was there. Riley and Crawford would finally debut their cars, and Chase would fall off the grid altogether, with Piccio and Multimatic barely hanging on by a thread. On the engine front, the Toyota engines were rebadged as Lexus engines and Chevrolet as Pontiacs. Another improvement was the driver talent tasked with piloting these entries. People like Scott Pruitt, Max Pappas, Scott Dixon, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Lucas Luer, Sasa Mason, Jimmy Johnson, Milka Duno, just to name a few. The Daytona prototype class was popular with NASCAR drivers because of the similarities in the cars. In truth, they were distant cousins of the Cup and Bush Series cars, as well as the fact that the centerpiece race was in their own backyard of Daytona. Oh, and did I mention that Grand Am was owned by NASCAR too? The 2004 Rolex 24 is a forgotten classic. It was a race heavily impacted by the rain and the last not to be dominated by a Riley chassis car. It would be a back and forth between a Ford powered Doran and a Chevy powered Crawford. The wet stuff started falling in the third hour and carried on through the night. And in the early morning hours, there was a three hour caution and subsequent red flag at sunrise due to the conditions. The race would be restarted with just over two and a half hours to go with the number two Howard Boss Motorsports Chevy Crawford in front with Dale Jr. and Tony Stewart and Andy Wallace on the driving strength. With the reigning defending 2003 champions, the number 54 Bell Motorsports Doran in second a lap behind. In this case, the lack of reliability played into the favor of the Daytona prototypes as the race leading Crawford of Tony Stewart started to have suspension issues. As the race got closer to the finish, the Howard Boss team started hammering wood blocks into the car to hold the right rear suspension together. In the final hour, Tony was on three wheels at any one time, and with 19 minutes to go, it all came undone. On the run to the bus stop chicane, the rear suspension finally gave way, sending Tony spinning into the wall and ending the race, and handing the victory to the number 54 Bell Motorsports Doran, denying Tony Stewart and Dale Jr. a win at the Rolex 24. The next race at Homestead Miami Speedway would overshadow the Rolex 24's drama. As approaching the end of the sprint race, this occurred. Yes, now, we're, now we're getting the wide car out. We're counting Not down the happen. second flag. Magnuson almost caught that go! Big and he's out. Dirt and dirt. We go side by side. These guys are driving each other off the road. Pappas oh, and Magnuson, bang. they bash. They continue to bash. Boy, oh boy, we saw the 27 in this last year with David Donahue, but it was Taze at the wheel. Now Magnuson and Pappas are giving it to each other. And you got to watch Mack and Bell stem drop because they're going to both have flat tires here. And they're top speed hit. That's oh. stupid. <laughs> That's just a little bit too much. I would think they need a reprimand. This is going to end There's tears, a wreck. and it has. Both of boy, them. Oh boy. And our man Wallace goes to the lead. That's like what they deserve. Both of them deserve to be right where they are. That was wild stuff on the track. They need a reprimand there. I'm just telling you, that, that's just a little too much. That's dangerous at 180 miles an hour if you're playing that game. That is wild racing. And you were riding with Max Pappas when they hit at well over 150 miles an hour. Now Pappas' door is open. We knew there was going to be contact. We knew there was going to be contact in this one, but nothing like that. And the smartest guy is going to win this race. Wallace will get the victory that he didn't get at the Rolex 24 if he can just hang in there. <laughs> he has inherited the lead by these two guys' aggressiveness. Well, a little is one thing and a lot another, and uh, they paid the ultimate price for it. Neither of these guys will win today. Plus, they get to go back to their team owners and explain why did you tear my car up like that? <laughs> boy, oh boy, knowing Chip Ganassi, he is not oh, going to no. be impressed. I wouldn't want to go back and see the boss. Let's have a look at some replays, a succession of replays. This was serious stuff. Yeah, that, that is a big monster hit. And it's at the fastest place of the whole racetrack. There, there's your payback. Take that. Now we're both going off. Neither of us going to win. Give it to Andy. Wow. 
Lucky that wasn't a much bigger wreck. Look at this. Here's the big hit. Here's the big hit. We were all right there. You were riding with Max Pappas when we had the onboard shot. And I'm not sure that Magnuson could pull that now, car up. Neither of these guys can even start to say this was an accident. Let's Listen go on board again. All of a sudden, this class actually had momentum. Not only could it provide for decent endurance racing with part failures looming around every corner, it could also captivate fans of door-to-door, -door, beaten and banging style of racing, and the Grand Am series was getting more and more popular. It attracted star power from NASCAR and the IndyCar worlds, and it provided for decent entertainment, and the quality and quantity of the grids kept getting better and better. 2005 and on looked bright. Grand Am actually stuck to their guns on this one, and they kept the class alive despite the dim outlook from 2003. However, there would be one team that would dominate the series from 2006 onwards that would define this class of racing. 2005 was the first year of rally dominance. The pseudo factory team of Wayne Taylor Racing would open the year by winning the Rolex 24 on their way to the series championship. In 2006, Chip Ganassi Racing took the Rolex 24 for the first time, and Crone Racing captured the championship that season. 2007, Chip Ganassi Racing won their second Rolex 24 in a row, and Gainesco Bob Stallings Racing took the championship. During this time, Brumos Racing would trade in their fab cars for Rileys, as had many of the others had done sooner. The Riley chassis accounted for well over half of the Daytona prototype grid by this point. Fabcar, Multimatic, and Piccio were extinct from the grid, leaving Crawford and a small minority of Dorans left to fight against the might of the Rileys. The 2005, 6, and 7 Rolex 24s and series championships were all won by the Rileys, and that trend would not change soon. On the engine front, we still had Porsche, Lexus, BMW, Pontiac, and Ford, though BMW and Ford only made up a small fraction of the grid. Meanwhile, in the American Le Mans series, they were going through something of a golden era. The LMP1 and LMP2 classes were on equal footing, meaning the P2 Penske Porsche RS Spiders and Acuras were fighting for overall wins against the factory Audis, and what would only be described as dogfights at every race. And the action showed in the ratings and the fan turnouts. To this point, the American Le Mans series was winning the U.S. sports car wars. And I mean, come on, what would you rather watch on your TV? Cars that are all the same chassis, barely developed since 2004, don't really look that great. And hell, they'll break by just you looking at them. Or, top of the line... Elegant, sleek, sexy sports cars that compete not just here, but around the world. Take your pick. You get one. I mean, really, who do you think is going to win this competition between Grand Am and the ALMS? 2008 brought a whole new generation of Daytona prototypes to center stage. Rally debuted their new Mark 20 that replaced the older Mark 11. It was sleeker, it was faster, it had more redefined aero, and was supposed to be an all-around better car in terms of drivability. It also had driver comforts that the previous generation of Daytona prototype did not have. Riley did not reinvent the wheel when designing their new car, they simply improved on the existing one. However, initially, many teams stuck with the Mark 11. Another big change was Delara, IndyCar's primary chassis manufacturer, had bought out Doran's manufacturer's license and made a completely new car. They also managed to lure over longtime Riley team Wayne Taylor Racing over to them. They also had on their team strength Doran Racing, the remnant of the former Bell Motorsports from earlier on in the video. Coincidentally owned by Kevin Doran, the man whose name was on the Doran Gen 1 Daytona prototype. Crawford developed a new Daytona prototype as well, the DP08, which ended up being a failure and would exit left stage not so long after it debuted. The most notable team to campaign this car was Ruby Tuesday Championship Racing, a subdairy of Alex Job Racing. Coyote would enter as a manufacturer as well, bringing back the famous name of AJ Foyt's racing chassis. Though it would not have much success, the most notable team to run this Coyote would be Spirited Daytona Racing. Lola would also develop a new car for the Daytona prototypes alongside Crone Racing. The Proto Auto Lola would have some success, but would never truly be on par with the Rileys it was competing against. 
Only Crone Racing would contest these cars. On the engine manufacturer front, Ford was making new strides with their motors, bringing over Pontiac stalwart Wayne Taylor Racing and Lexus stalwart Mike Shank Racing. Pontiac had proven to be the motor to have. It was dominant in the pre previous season's short haul races, but on the endurance races, the Lexuses seemed to have their number more times than not, and Lexus's big team that they were partnered with was Chip Ganassi Racing. A team like this partnered with Lexus showed massive results when it counted the most. 2008 was a very Chip Ganassi Racing year. Along with their third Rolex 24 win in a row, they finally collected a season championship, winning 6 out of 14 races and finishing on the podium a total of 8 times. 2009 would be a welcome change of pace for the Daytona prototype class. Team Penske would join the fight after winding down a successful four seasons in the American Le Mans series as the factory Porsche team with the yellow DHL sponsored Porsche RS Spiders. This change would spell major implications for the future of the American Le Mans series, but more on that later. At the Rolex 24, we finally saw the down to the wire battle that we had deserved and longed for out of this class. See, in previous runnings, any contender within a lap of the leader usually fell by the wayside by mid-morning, leaving the leader to pace around seemingly aimlessly and unchallenged. This time, it was a four-car fight to the end, with two Bromos Racing Porsche Rileys versus the 01 Chip Ganassi Racing Lexus Rally, and finally bringing up fourth, the Wayne Taylor Racing Ford Delara. In the end, it would be an emotional return to victory lane for the Brumos camp, with the 58 car taking the win and the famous 59 car in third. Chip Ganassi Racing lost for the first time since 2006, but claimed a second place. At the end of the season, the number 99 Red Dragon from Gainesco Bob Stallings Racing had won the championship, with Alex Gurney on board, yes, the son of Dan, upsetting Chip Ganassi Racing Scott Pruitt Memo Rojas by six points in the championship. This was the closest that the championship had been in the Daytona prototype era and was an exciting one that really did come down to the very final race. The 2010 Rolex 24 would be won by Brumos Racing again. Well, kind of. See, after 2009, Brumos Racing actually split into two teams. They continued with the famous 59. However, the other car would be renumbered the number 9 car. And it may be a team, if you're familiar with IMSA, that is actually a pretty big stalwart in the series now, known as Action Express Racing. They upset a Chip Ganassi Racing at the Rolex 24 to win on debut, which was an unheard of feat at the time. However, Chip Ganassi Racing would once again win the championship in 2010, and they would return to victory lane at the Rolex 24 in 2011. They would also go back to back in championships at the end of the season, winning the 2011 Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series Championship. 2012 would bring the first major overhaul since 2003 to the Daytona prototype class. The Generation 3 body looked to bring more manufacturer styling cues to the class, as well as add a fresh take on the tired old car. The chassis remained the same, but still modified to allow for a smaller cockpit greenhouse. The nose was significantly changed to make the car more aesthetically pleasing versus the slant nose designs of the past. The side pods were left open for manufacturer development, allowing distinguishing styling cues to be added. A larger rear wing and ability to attach dive planes to the nose were added to add more downforce to the cars. Riley continued their production of the chassis and body kits, however their new rival would be the first major competition to their monopoly of the class. Enter the Corvette Daytona prototype. The new for 2012 Corvette body was unlike Challengers from the past, this time it was a body kit versus a whole chassis. The skin of the Corvette DP could be attached to any pre-existing chassis, including the Delara and Coyote chassis, and yes, even a Riley. A field of 14 would line up for the 50th Rolex 24, though some of the older generation Daytona prototypes would still contest until the end of the Grand Am era. On the engine front, in 2010 Chevy would replace the now defunct Pontiac, and for 2012 Chevy would bring the iconic Corvette name and design to the Daytona prototype class. They would be set to compete against Ford and BMW. At the 50th Rolex 24, there would be another pleasant surprise. The always dominant Chip Ganassi racing duo faltered throughout the race, leaving two fresh faces to fight it out for the win. Peter Barron's Starworks team was new to the class in name only. Previously, they had competed as Sam Axe Racing. They had good results, including a second in the 2007-24. Sam Axe even competed in the IndyCar series with Milka Duno, but folded not long after, after allegations came to light against team co-owner Henry Zogabe for money laundering from a Ponzi scheme. 
after which Baron reformed his team into Starworks Motorsports. The other protagonist was Mike Shank Racing. They were known as the little team that could, and though they had come close to winning the Rolex 24s in years past, Lady Luck never truly shined on them. With fires, engine failures, and accidents catching them out, the two teams would go head-to-head -head in an epic battle which would end with the number 60 Meyershank Racing Riley Ford pulling into victory lane in another feel-good story. The rest of the 2012 season would be a titanic battle between old rivals from Chip Ganassi Racing and Wayne Taylor Racing, and in the end, the Chip Ganassi Racing crew with Scott Pru and Mamo Rojas would claim yet another championship. On September the 5th, 2012, it was formally announced that the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series would merge with the IMSA-sanctioned American Le Mans Series. After years of competing against one another, the two American sports car championships would once again become one starting in 2014. For the first time, it could be said that the old, cheap, two-framed grandpas known as the Daytona Prototypes beat the elegant, sleek, and sexy P1 machinery, eerily foreshadowing the events that would take place less than a decade later in the World Endurance Championship. Grand Am's cross-controlled approach managed to win over the American Le Mans series, but why? Well, it's as simple as this. The American Le Mans series went through a golden era in 2005 through to 2008. As fans were treated to amazing battles from the factory Audi R10s and Penske Porsche RS Spiders. Add in a few Acuras for good measure, and it's a recipe for a great race at every race. However, if you take away the Audis and Porsches from the recipe for success, it quickly collapses. In short, the American Le Mans series had become dependent on the manufacturers for their success. But when the manufacturers left, so did the fans. And, no, adding new classes to add car count doesn't work. IMSA sometimes doesn't learn. By 2013, the American Le Mans series had two LMP1 cars and a bumper five-car LMP2 entry, while the Daytona prototypes were able to pull 13 regularly entered prototypes, plus a few extras at Daytona. So, I referred to you my question from earlier. Who do you think would win? With the merger looming, but yet still one whole year off, 2013 felt like a somber year for Grand Am. The series as they knew it was on life support. Though they technically won the battle over the American Le Mans series, the semi-sportsmen feel the series would be at an end when the checkered flag flew at Lime Rock Park. The final Rolex 24 at Daytona of the Grand Am era reached a fitting conclusion with the 0-1 Chip Ganassi Racing BMW Riley grabbing the victory. The most dominant team, with the most dominant chassis, winning the one final time in the Endurance Classic. The 2013 season came down to the wire, and it came down to Wayne Taylor Racing and Chip Ganassi Racing once again. This time, the Wayne Taylor Racing crew got the job done at Lime Rock Park to take the final DP Class Championship, a almost storybook ending to a 10-year run for the class. If you thought the end of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series was the end of the story, well, you're wrong. For the 2014 season, the Daytona prototypes were paired against LMP2s from the former American Le Mans series and the new creatively named Prototype Class. I know, they could have done anything else. The LMP2s were newer, lighter, more technologically advanced, sleeker, sexier, all carbon fiber, and did I mention, faster. The LMP2s were pegged back so the DPs could offer some competition. Ultimately, the LMP2s were pegged back so much that they struggled to run with the DPs. At the first race of the IMSA era at Daytona, it looked like a Grand Am race from years previous, with an all-DP battle at the end, with Action Express gaining their second victory and DPs grabbing the first four positions with the first P2, fifth, three laps behind. After another DP show at Sebring, P2 teams started to feel disgruntled, and the issue even forced the Muscle Milk Picket Racing team that had won the final LMP1 ALMS championship to withdraw from racing altogether. By season's end, the DP would claim all but two of the 11 races that the prototype class would compete in, and Action Express grabbed the championship over Wayne Taylor Racing, with the nearest P2 in fifth in the final standings. 2015 would be more of the same for the prototype class. The DPs would claim every race over the P2s, and, again, it's not because the DPs were better cars, but because of, because of the performance adjustments made to peg the P2s back to make the class competitive. And it worked. Too much. That year's Rolex 24 was claimed by the 02 Chip Ganassi Racing Ford Riley. This would be a fitting win, as it would be the final win in the Rolex 24 for the Daytona prototypes, 
And how fitting would it be for the best team and the best chassis manufacturer to bring home the win? By the end of the 24 hours, there were no P2 finishers left with the final one dropping out shortly after halfway. The championship was again claimed by Action Express Racing and their Corvette Coyote, and once again the nearest P2 would be 7th in the final standings. On July 2nd, 2015, the announcement finally came. The Daytona prototype era would be at an end after the 2016 season concluded. The Daytona prototypes would be replaced with the LMP2-based DPI cars starting in 2017. After 13 years, the old cars would finally be put to bed, and at last ending a true era and the ending of the last remnant of the Grand Am Rolex sports car series. In 2016, a Ligier P2 from Extreme Speed Motorsports would grab the first major win for a non-DP in the post-merger era at the Rolex 24. They would follow this win up with a win at the 12 Hours of Sebring. The final win for any DP car would come at the 2016 race at Circuit of the Americas and would be delivered by Ricky and Jordan Taylor from Wayne Taylor Racing. A P2 Ligier from the former DP team Mike Shank Racing would end the initial era for the IMSA WeatherTech Championship when the checkered flag flew at Petit Le Mans in 2016, an era had truly ended and the competitive era for the Daytona prototypes had come to a close. When looking at the Daytona prototype class in hindsight, they accomplished the initial goals. They were cost effective and they had longevity. They had pushed Grand Am ahead of the American Le Mans series and forced an end to the US sports car split. One of the underappreciated facts about these cars was exactly the longevity of them. For example, the two Chip Ganassi Racing Rileys were built in 2003 and competed until the very end in 2016. The Daytona prototypes were never visually stunning and none, no one ever accused them of being sexy or exotic, but they hold an important place in the US sports car racing history and they won't be soon forgotten. For me personally, I do hold many fond memories of this formula as I grew up watching them. I was sad to see the era end in 2016, but in terms of the survival of the prototype class, it was a move that had to be done. These cars now exist only in our memories and the occasional appearance at historical events. Fun fact, not too long ago, a Gen 1 Pontiac Rally competed in the 25 Hours of Thunder Hill. The Daytona prototype class was and still is an important part of racing history. Personally, I am thankful for the memory memories that this class had brought me, and I hope after watching this video, you have an appreciation for the small part of the big picture in history that this car holds. And also, thank you so much for viewing this video. This one, I believe, is a little bit longer than the R15, but there was quite a bit more history to cover. I did try to narrow it down as much as possible, but, you know, with this type of video, they do typically run long. But... I really do appreciate it, and again, more stuff to come. I got some more videos planned out, and yeah, so thank you so much for watching, guys, and as always, peace out.